right, thank you for coming to my talk. Everyone's starting to look spiffy, MTLS and identity with Linkerd and Teleport. I was told that when the music faded, that was my cue to start. Uh, I'm Dave Sudia. Um, quick agenda of what we're gonna go over here today are the contributors to this, because I'm speaking, but uh, there was another person who helped me out a lot with this that I wanna give credit to. Um, we'll kind of talk about what are spiffy, Linkerd and Teleport, go over the technologies involved what we are trying to accomplish with this and why we feel it's important. Uh, we'll go over the architecture of the demo that I'm gonna do and do a quick demo, uh, and then talk about challenges with this process and this project and lessons we learned, which I think is the actual interesting part. Uh, hubris caught up with me for the first time in my career with this talk where the abstract is like, yes, everything's going perfectly, and I'm gonna tell you that did not happen, and we're gonna, learn, we're gonna find out why. Uh, so yeah, I'm, side, I'm Dave Sudia. I'm a senior product engineer at Teleport. Uh, the other person who contributed heavily to this but who could not be here today is Flynn, who's a technical evangelist at Buoyant, who make Linkerd. Uh, we, this was very much a 50-50 effort from him and me, um, and I wanted to give him credit for that. So technologies, quick survey just so I can gauge experience here. Uh, who is familiar with Spiffy? And, and per, perhaps Spire as well. Pretty good chunk of the audience, okay. Um, I'm gonna go over Spiffy a little bit, but I'm not gonna go super in depth. There are a couple other talks here uh, that go over at a much, you know, much more comprehensive and, and basic level. Uh, anyone familiar with Linkerd? Slightly fewer hands, okay, I'll go over that a little bit more. And anyone familiar with us, with Teleport? Couple, about the same amount, all right, cool. So Spiffy is a CNCF graduated project. It is a standard to provide strongly attested cryptographic identities across platforms. So breaking that down a little bit, the attestation piece here is that you have some metadata about an application or process that's running through that metadata. You're able to say, I know that this application is this application or this process that's running. I'm going to give it an identity uh, via a, 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 a document that we'll talk about in a moment. Um, and then that can be confirmed on other ends and we can establish identity between workloads. So parts of the Spiffy standard are a format for uniquely specifying that identity, the Spiffy ID. It's in a URI format that starts with Spiffy and then has some other components to it. Standards for encoding that ID into verifiable ID documents, uh, which are Spiffy verifi verifiable identity documents or SVIDs, and those can be X509 certificates or JSON web tokens. There are pluses and minuses to both that, again, not for another talk. Uh, processes that workloads should use to validate a received SVID, so if they receive a request or are sending a request and getting a, an initial handshake response back, how do I say, here's my ID, how do I process the ID coming back, how do I, ver how do I guarantee that that identifiable document is valid? and a set of APIs that workloads can use to do that, the, workload, the, the Spiffy workload API, generally provided over Linux socket. It is often seen with Spire, which is an implementation of the standard, but we're gonna dig into the separation a little bit in the process of this uh, talk. And Spiffy has been adopted by most of the major cloud providers, so AWS, uh, you can use Spiffy ident uh, IDs with AWS roles anywhere. I learned this morning that Google uh, now supports Spiffy IDs and SFIDs as part of their workload identity system, so you can use the inbuilt Google stuff where you, they'll now accept X509 certificates uh, that are Spiffy formatted. So that's a quick overview of Spiffy. Uh, Linkerd, also a CNCF graduated project, it's a service mesh that adds security, observability, and reliability to any Kubernetes cluster. The, I was a Linkerd user. I was, for many years, I was an end, in, in an end user role, and I used Linkerd uh, as an end user because at the time you could do Linkerd install. And it was great because then you had a service mesh. And I went and looked at the Istio docs, and I think Istio is a great project, but I did not have a team of people to run it. <laughs> and so uh, it was the thing I really appreciated about Linkerd. Um, one of the core features it does is provides automatic MTLS via an internal identity service, and this far predates the Spiffy standard, so they do not use Spiffy internally. They have a control plane that we'll look at in a second, and that handles identity. Their control plane has a certificate authority. Every proxy sidecar receives a certificate. Each certificate is bound to a service account, 
and via that they're able to uh, identify or do identity within the mesh. So general architecture of Linkerd here is you have a control plane, it has a couple of different pods in it, uh, one injects proxies when you ask it to, one handles destination and routing in the mesh, and one does that identity piece. And then the proxy gets an identity from the identity thing, finds out where requests should go from the destination service, and routes things through the mesh. So it's, it's a pretty simple setup with, with quite a bit of power. Teleport. Uh, we are a security service. We have AGPL and commercial licenses. We're not part of CNCF. Um, what we do is provide on-demand least privileged access for infrastructure and identity and pol policy governance. And we'll look at architecture of this in a second, but the core value point here is that you run all of your traffic through teleport proxies, and by doing that, you can close all public ports. So you have an agent running on your service for SSHD, you have an agent running in your Kubernetes cluster that handles all kubectl requests coming in and out from the API server, and then you can shut them off to everything else, everything works through a reverse tunnel, and everything gets routed through teleport. We started with human identity, we expanded into machine identity, so the original core of it was I'm a human logging into a server via SSH and we want to be able to control access to that and audit requests and audit actions taken on those servers and then now you can um, sort of in a workload identity via very much a workload ID way, we get metadata about your GitHub organization and actions or your uh, CI server running in AWS and we're able to do, to validate that those are machines and they can have the same kind of access rules and stuff as humans. So general architecture here is I'm a human or a machine, I request a, an identity from the auth service, I get short-lived X509 certificates, this may be sounding very familiar, and then I am able to send requests to other services, other proxies and agents that have short-lived X509 certificates and we can handshake and agree that I should be able to access that resource. So this made Spiffy a very natural thing for us because it was all the concepts were already ways that we operate at, in terms of a security, infrastructure security organization. The big difference for us is that we've mainly protected infrastructure and this is now applications. So a couple of things to keep in mind for later in the talk here is that uh, for us, all identity is verified through the teleport cluster. So moving into Spiffy is very different for us because now we are no longer running things through our proxies, right? We're just providing an identity. Um, for Linkerd, automatic MTLS is provided via their internal identity service. So this is again a branch out for them because now they're talking to things outside of the mesh outside of this internal identity service. Why are those important? You'll find out. So what was our goal? Linkerd has a new feature called mesh expansion. So this, uh, related to that uh, thing I was just saying, this is now, okay, we wanna be able to speak to services that are running outside of the mesh. Maybe there's some workload you've got running on a server somewhere, it's not in Kubernetes, or it's in a cluster where for whatever reason you can't install Linkerd, and we still wanna be able to validate identity and work with that thing uh, with the mesh. It enables MTLS connections with those workloads. It uses Spiffy to do so. So their thought was, all right, if we're gonna be interacting with other systems and services, let's not write our whole own, you know, proprietary uh, identity service that's just for Linkerd, let's adopt the standard. We're in CNCF, let's go with this. An interesting thing about that is every prior mesh expansion demo and proof of concept they had done used Spire to provide SVIDs. So we have been working on providing SVIDs and basically being the, an alternative system to Spire being that root piece that provides the identities and, and uh, validates workloads. And so I was talking with Flynn and I was like, well, hey, you use Spiffy and we use Spiffy, our stuff should just work together, right? It's a standard. And that is, uh, was a very optimistic thing to think. And in the end, not wrong, but, um, but we'll kind of see why. So we set out to, can we use Teleport in place of Spire to enable Linkerd mesh expansion? Why we think that's important. One is to show off the benefits of adopting the standard. It's a cool, exciting new ecosystem. Every spiffy talk I've been to today, and I'm going to the other ones as well, because there's a lot to learn. It's fast growing, and people are excited about it. We want to encourage others to join the ecosystem, grow the momentum. It's, it's good to be part of a large, healthy ecosystem, and, and we really want to encourage that. Um, on our side, particularly, I think we want to show Spire is an implementation. At one point it was called the reference implementation, 
I've noticed that, and I don't think this is wrong or bad, that it's now an implementation. And while it's excellent, there are valid issues for some users, as we've done research talking with people who want to use Teleport for this. Um, I was talking to someone at a Fortune 50, and they were like, it doesn't scale in a way that we need it to. Um, there, there are other reasons why people, it may not be the right solution for them. For me, I used to work at a startup where I was the DevOps team. My team had three people on it. We were DevOps, we were SecOps, we were tooling, we, <laughs> we were everything. And, um, and not everyone's gonna be able to take the time and, and have the ability to run and maintain their own Spire cluster. Um, one of my particular concerns that I've kind of found, and we'll talk about this in the rest of the talk too and see this, is that things are starting to be built to the Spire standard, not to the Spiffy standard. And they are separate projects, um, but I think that they're packaged together so often and this, again, is an, like, obviously I have an internal bias, uh, intentional and internal bias for this, but I, if I put my end user hat on, which was the majority of my career, I really didn't like it when things didn't work the way that they were supposed to or that they were said in the documentation. And, and that's starting to happen as people just make this base default assumption that Spire is what's in place. Um, We'll look at a specific example with Linkerd in here, but also just as an example, like Cilium has Spiffy support, but it has Spiffy support by uh, deploying a Spire instance, and if and it uses the Spire API, not the Spiffy API for sp some specific things. So if you don't implement also the Spire API, you can't step in with Cilium. Um, and I, I think for us, it's like we're trying to show you can implement, right? Like I'm not, I, I'm aware of a couple other organizations that are starting to come in and implement as a Spire alternative, and it's like, great, that's good that there are more people than us doing that. We want to encourage that and also just show, like, you can do this um, because that's another important part of the ecosystem as much as on the consumption side. And as we will see, uh, I think a valid and important part of this test was to see if it's, see if being based on a standard actually does what we think it does. So we'll get into that. Um, I'm moving faster than I thought, so we'll have probably have time for questions. So. So here's a, a demo, and, uh, and I'm gonna say this is a rather complex chart, so I'm gonna walk through it, but I think it helps to visualize this before I get into the code and show things. So, and, <laughs> um, and I'm gonna talk about some, some challenges with this once, once I've shown the demo. But basically, we have, within a Kubernetes cluster, and I'm running K3D on my laptop, um, we have this three app system, or four app system. So there's a GUI, the GUI calls out to an API uh, called Faces GUI, calls out to an API called face. That one calls out to a color service and a smiley service. And right now, they are running all in my cluster. So we'll, we'll show the change here. But basically, the face service calls out to the color and smiley service and gets colors and smileys. And you can run it so that it breaks in certain ways to show off some Linkerd features. But, um, but the core thing right now is that, that that's running all in the cluster. So what we're gonna do in this demo is we're gonna actually delete color and smiley from the cluster, and we're gonna move them out so that they're running in containers outside of the cluster, still just locally on my machine for the purposes of this. Um, they, some, so some limitations or some requirements of the Linkerd mesh expansion are that the, prox, the Linkerd proxy processes running outside of the mesh still need to be able to talk directly into the cluster, so for this, I have turned the, uh, and specifically the DNS. So I've actually turned kubedns's service into a node port instead of a cluster IP, and these containers are gonna be talking straight into, into the mesh in the cluster. And then these services are going to get spiffy IDs from the workload API, which is gonna be provided on sockets from a process that I'm running on my side. So that's the, the mesh side, and then if we come from the teleport side, Basically, like I said, we are standing in for Spire. So if you're familiar with Spire's architecture, the core of it is you have a Spire server and a Spire agent. The server handles all of the core auth authentication processes and the agent handles providing SFIDs up to systems. So there are mechanics on our side that are a little different, but the core of it is that uh, I have a teleport server cluster running, um, in this case, up in the cloud right now, and that is handling uh, certificate signing and all of that. And then we have a, a, a binary called tbot that handles more than just workload identity, but is running also locally, um, and that will be providing the SFIDs out on the workload API. Let's look at some code and actually do this thing. 
So as I said before, we've got this service. We're looking at the GUI. Um, I am going to run some commands here. So the first thing we're gonna do is delete those services. And if I come back here, as those requests go through, we can now see that the thing is very angry because it no longer has its dependent services. So the next thing I need to do here is just run a DNS service that is going to, again, talk in to the, the cluster directly to kubeDNS, um, and that is going to provide DNS forwarding over to the containers. And the next thing I wanna do is just make sure that I know what IP that got assigned locally. Yes, great. Okay. So the next thing I'm gonna do is start up Tbot. And we're pretty secure. We're security company, an infrastructure security company, so um, this looks bad, and it's mainly because we make it really hard to get tokens and run things on servers that we can't identify. And since I don't have a TPM on this Mac, uh, I have to <laughs> um, basically create this token right off the bat and do it all within here. So I don't wanna get into the super mechanics of that, but basically I'm gonna run a local process that creates a bot within our system, gets a token for it that allows it to output SVIDs, and then we can see the output coming here, and this is basically saying, all right, I've got listener op listeners open for the workload API for a color service and for a smiley service, and that's what we need from that. So the next thing I'm gonna do is Linkerd needs to know where in the network these, uh, these services that I'm moving out are available from. So I'm gonna create this external workload CRD that's a Linkerd CRD and basically tell it my color service is gonna be at 172.18.06, my smiler service is gonna be at 07, and I'm going to apply those in. Great, and then I have to do a very silly thing that I believe is a temporary thing right now, but uh, there's no controller for those at the moment, so they just go in there, but they never become ready, and at the moment, it's the user's responsibility to tell the cluster that they're ready, and I've had long conversations with Flynn about that, because uh, I don't think it should be the, uh, all right, the demo gods are only being semi-nice to me today. I'll just run these. There we go. Uh, but I don't really think it should be the user's responsibility to uh, establish the readiness condition of something. Um, and then what I can do now is I should be able to do this command and just check with Linkerd, do you know where this thing should be? And it's telling me, yes, I believe that that service should be at 172.18.07, which is good. That means that when I make requests here, it's gonna try to route out to that DNS uh, through the mesh. So my next step is to actually start up the services. So a couple core things here um, that I think are worth looking at and I've got the time to do it. So basically these applications are running and um, we are doing a couple of fancy things inside of these containers and the main thing is that we are, and one of the reasons we're running it in containers and I'm not running it on my Mac is that we're actually changing IP tables to say, hey, when you're doing anything, when you're looking for anything that would be within a cluster uh, uh, CIDR range, like you need to be going over here and using the proxy and talking to stuff that's in the cluster. And then we are configuring Linkerd, uh, the proxy process that's running in here uh, to know where things in the mesh are and to have the correct DNS names that it's expecting because you can configure a few things in Linkerd and so it just needs to make sure that, for example, it knows to talk to the Linkerd destination .linkerd .service .cluster .local and that sort of thing. Um, so we're gonna start up color. Next hop has invalid, oh no. The demo gods have decided to be mad at me today. All right, hold on. This is most likely just an issue with the, DNS thing, that's at five. Let me just make sure that I change that here. Yes, the DNS is at 05, okay. Then, do I have the port right? Thirty-two seven sixty-three. This is the most persnickety and finicky part of this, and it's 
all the mesh. That's what I'm, I have to say. Uh, all right. Da, 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 da. Did I start that? That should be correct. If I don't figure this out in the next 30 seconds or so, you're just gonna have to believe me and we'll go on with the talk. Um, okay. Yes. We're talking to the node on dot three. We're talking to DNS on dot five. And Next stop is an invalid gateway. All right, I'm gonna come back to this at the end so I don't waste all of your time in case this doesn't go someplace. Theater training kicks in, you just move on with the show. So let's talk about challenges other than the next stop having a bad gateway. So at the beginning, there were some assumptions made that created some challenges for us. On Linkerd's part, they were using Spire, and again, I think like, uh, if we go in and look at the code, um, the variables are not the spiffy location, it's the spire location, and that caused some complications beyond just making the assumption that I'll talk about in a little bit. Another one of their assumptions is that you have full control over your certificate infrastructure that also caused some problems that I'll go over in a little bit. On teleport side, we kind of make the assumption by general, but just generally that everything is controlled by and within the teleport cluster. That's how our model has operated for forever, that's how we protect everything, and so stepping out of that caused some issues for us as well. In the middle, there was complexity, as we see with the demo that I was just trying to do. Folks, we work in a complex field. And, you know, I miss the halcyon days of 2018 when you could, like, do a Kubernetes demo and it would just, you know, like, just went and stood up a cluster and then all we were trying to show is, like, look, you can make things talk to each other. <laughs> and now, uh, setting up this demo, like, you're setting up quite a bit of infrastructure. Um, so one of the first things I ran into is I was trying to run this on Docker and uh, before I figured out that I could map container volumes or container sockets out to a volume and then map it back in. I was trying to run Tbot on my Mac and realized you can't map OS sockets into a Linux socket container. Uh, I tried standing up an EKS cluster and it just wasn't using kubeDNS for some reason. I don't know, I, given that you have to hand EKS like five different subnets and have those configured correctly, I'm sure it was my fault, but I don't know why. Uh, then I started just running everything on a Docker engine on a Linux machine and started getting really obscure errors about closed transports that I couldn't figure out. Um, and so I'll say that it took about three and a half weeks just to get the infrastructure for this demo uh, working in the correct way. And, and it's one of those things where I think as we, like I had direct access to the engineers working on these two features and I think it's always a thing I keep in mind about like user experience is like we have to have, if you're, if you're from a vendor here, like we have to have our, our act together from a user experience way before we push things out to users um, because it can be very frustrating and we need to make it as easy as we can. There were questions like Linkerd runs with two trust routes because you can pass multiple uh, root CAs as a trust route because it works to do that for swapping so you can have, uh, like you can use cert manager for example as the, as the provider of the root CA but we weren't quite sure how it was gonna work with something completely outside of that system. Um, we were pretty confident it was gonna work but uh, don't know until you try. And then we kind of realized like, oh wait, on our end, Teleport doesn't support federation with Spiffy yet. Like we, again, and this kind of comes back to the problem of our assumptions, right, is we provide, we are a certificate authority and we kind of assume that everything's gonna happen within our ecosystem. So we had no way of accepting like Linkerd's certificate and we weren't quite sure if that was gonna be an issue either. And then there were just little things like, oh, right, you gotta run those IP table commands before the proxy starts. That, that helps to have everything in order. And then there was stuff that was just straight up broken. So, Fun story, Linkerd uses elliptic curve signed certificates. They are well tested, they are secure, it's a great algorithm to use. And that's all they do because configurability is not generally a way to improve security, right? You wanna have, you wanna be opinionated about this stuff. Teleport uses RSA signed certificates. We use RSA 2048. One of the reasons we do that is that till about a year ago, like AWS didn't accept anything except RSA. We were trying to maximize compatibility so you can use this across clouds and all that. And again, configurability is not generally a way to improve security, so we are very limited in that. We, we only sign things using RSA. Well, it turns out Linkerd does not accept RSA signed certificates in any way, shape, or form. It will reject them. 
And teleport can't sign with any other algorithm. We provide no way to configure that. We are actually building this now, which is another part of the lessons we'll talk about. But it was, it, we got to a point with this project, and this was the thing I referred to at the beginning, where we just went, oh, this just won't work. Because it turns out we don't use the same algorithm, and that's a thing. And so what you're seeing, or what you were seeing, if it had been successful and I hadn't hit that next top gateway problem, is actually running on a branch. Uh, I'd love to say that this is a practic exa practical example that you can go home and try today, except that it's a custom branch that we cut so that we can generate certificates using elliptic curve instead of RSA, and it's a thing that it only exists in a GitHub pull request and on my laptop. Other things that were straight up broken, dependencies. Linkerd uses the simple ASN1 Rust crate to parse certificates. Simple ASN1 does not allow certs without a subject. If you have a certificate without a subject, it just hits that block and goes, can't parse it, sorry. Spire always inserts a subject. So Linkerd had not run into this problem when testing because uh, if there is no uh, subject provided, Spire just inserts like a date and uh, an organization thing and a couple other like optional subject fields so that there's something there. And again, this is kind of what, what I get to if like, Certificate state, X509 certificate standards don't say anything about subject being required. You'll rarely see one without one, but it's not required. Um, and so it's important that we have various and diverse organizations building within this so that we catch all of these edge cases, right? This was a problem because teleport does not populate a subject unless you provide a DNS SAN as part of your, this, uh, the mandate within the workload ID generator and TBOD and how it generates the spiffy IDs and the SFIDs. So also what you're seeing contains some hacky stuff because I could either provide a DNS SAN or I could just force our code to insert a subject every time, which is what I opted to do on this branch. So again, uh, I, I, this was such a fascinating thing to do and I'm really glad I we, we did it because we exposed some, some real concrete issues. And at the end, um, when you're not using infrastructure as code, always triple check your spelling. Uh, this was the first time I wished I didn't work remote because I feel like if we had been sitting together around a monitor, someone would have caught my spelling error like a week earlier than we did. And I was spelling CNSC as CSNC only in the external workload and so things didn't work for an extra week and I'm missing some hair because of that. So what are lessons from this whole, whole process? Uh, <laughs> what does compatible mean? Compatible can mean a lot of things, and you would think that if you're working on a standard, uh, that things would just work, but there is actually a proposal up right now, um, uh, for, uh, there's a new proposal for changing spiffy.io to include a compatibility matrix, because people say that they're implementing spiffy, right, but there are a lot of components of spiffy, and are you implementing all the forms of attestation? Like at the moment, we only provide Linux uh, process attestation. We don't have Kubes uh, Kubernetes attestation. We don't have a lot of the other things like that Spire does as, as implemented through plugins. We're working on them, but at the pace that we can. Um, what kind of infrastructure does it support, right? Like uh, what type of SVID? Can you provide JWTs and X509 or just one or just the other, right? Can you accept federation? So it, I think this is a thing that's well acknowledged within Spiffy community, but I think if you're entering into the Spiffy ecosystem, either as a consumer or, or you know, user or as a vendor, really important to kind of think about like what part of Spiffy are you focused on? What are your needs? If you're on the consumption end, like what plugins do you need, right? Um, what sort of, uh, are, you gonna, are you in a position where you have something terminating TLS in the middle and you're gonna have to send through your SFID as a JWT or are X509 certificates gonna, gonna work for you? Um, and you don't really know if you're compatible until you try it, because there are standards around the standard. And I think that's a, a critical thing that we, we learned going through this process is we are both spiffy compliant, except that we don't <laughs> we use the same algorithm for signing certificates and one, and one project doesn't accept one. And, and so there are things under and around all of this that, that are part of that, right? Like, Again, coming back to the certificate structure, we don't populate subjects, which is just fine until it's not, right? So what will you discover as you go through this, I think is an interesting question, and it's something that I'd love to see as more places start to get in and, uh, and implement this and test with each other if, if they're compatible, is like what are the other edge cases around all of these things? What are the other hidden holes that we're not seeing um, because they're not directly part of the Spiffy standard, right? So was it worth it? I think so, it worked, kind of. 
especially today, kind of, we got like two thirds of the way through the demo um, <laughs> that worked 20 minutes ago. And, uh, but beyond that, like it worked kind of, it, other than me having to cut a branch and us learning that, you know, we need to have flexibility in our signing algorithms, it worked great. And I think that the key lesson there for us on both sides is like, it showed all these kinds of gaps that we need to fill anyways, right? Like, we're, it, it's kind of, it was kind of already on our roadmap to provide a way for organizations to opt into EC instead of RSA. That has gone up a little bit and we're working on that now. Um, and, and again, we're not gonna provide a mix, but you'll be able to, to opt into one or the other. Um, and I think a, a core thing here is that this wouldn't have even been a concept without Spiffy, right? It's not like I ever would have gone to Flynn and been like, hey, you wanna work together on our products doing, and our projects doing uh, you know, external mesh and MTLS together if there weren't a standard, right? And I think like, I've been, I've been hanging around CNCF for a long time now and I'm starting to get more opinionated about what projects are good for it and what are not good for it, but this is a project that's great for CNCF because it is a, it is a communication standard that pulls people into a common way of speaking. It's not the XKCD, oh, now we have a 15th standard thing, and I'm very excited that organizations are starting to opt into it and work together on it because that's exciting and it's just gonna grow and, and everyone's gonna have a better time because of it. So that, that's been the biggest thing for me is like, um, you know, it's great when we come together and, and the projects that people create and work on like engender better collaboration between everybody. I think that's like the real spirit of CNCF. And I think you should adopt Spiffy. Uh, if you're, whether you're a user or a vendor, if you're working in the space, you should be coming in and, and putting effort in, and helping to build it because it's a really cool place to be. So thank you, that was my talk. Uh, I did want to leave a couple minutes for questions. Um, you can reach out to me or Flynn here. Uh, I definitely recommend going to spiffy.io if you have not already uh, and reading the turtle book uh, because they're both excellent deeper dives into everything I talked about today if you didn't have the background already. Um, and yeah, happy to answer any questions. Yes, oh, thank you. Yes, thank you. Yeah, okay, so just for everyone, so the question is basically why did we decide to build our own instead of using Spire? Um, and I think the, the core of that is that to, to allude or to go back to a thing I was saying earlier, like we, we already live and breathe X509 certificates. This was a new form of certificate to create. We have a feature called machine ID and machine ID already was basically doing, was node level attestation. Right, so, so you, we could verify, okay, you're running on a node that we believe to be something that should be running workloads and that's how we allow machines to talk to machines. And so for us, it's a natural extension to then build in workload attestation on top of that using all of the binaries that we are already using in all the processes, right? Um, so, I, I, like, the core of it is we already have a, a super highly scalable infrastructure and product around doing this, and it was just about expanding the capabilities of that versus having to learn to run and operate an, like, an entire thing to add a value on to our product, if that, if that makes sense, right, and, and our project, because this is all lives in the OSS version as well. Um, so, yeah, I, and I mean, and I think, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I can, I'm happy to expand further than that, but uh, you know, hopefully that answers it a, a bit. Again, I, I don't think that Spire is a bad project and I'm not trying to talk down on all the people who've spent years working on it. It's a fantastic project that is super capable. Um, I would not want to have to run it myself. I think like that's the major limitation right now is that like I, we know teams um, at our customers even that are running it and very happy, but it's a team that's running it and I think like I've always been at smaller places where I'd be like, can I buy it? Um, 
Yeah, yeah, totally, yes. Yeah. Yeah, and, 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 and yeah, and I'd love to extend that conversation with you later because I think it's an important thing to talk about. Again, I don't, I don't think it's bad. I, I certainly don't want to be, come across as standing up here talking down on Spire, but I, like everything else, I think there's room for, for multiple people to be working on it. Any other questions? I got 13 seconds. Okay, well thank you, oh, oh sorry, I, <laughs> I'm very well lit up here, <laughs> and it's blinding a bit. Yeah, that's a great question, and let me just kind of show, so basically, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's basically said, I, I alluded to like no, needing to know about like your certificate infrastructure, and I, I didn't uh, dive into that effectively enough. So basically, when you start up Linkerd, um, and you can do this in a number of ways using Helm charts or whatever, uh, you you have to hand it um, a, a root CA certificate, and then you have to generate issuer certificate and key off of that root CA and pass those to Linkerd. And the the, the root one is really a trust root. Um, and so that'll become important here in a second. But it then uses the issuer certificate, the intermediate one, to do its identity work within the mesh. And the reason that you pass it a trust route is so that you can do multi, uh, like cross mesh work and, and multi, uh, multi cluster work. So the thing that we needed to do was this is the certificate that I'm passing in right now, and this is the public one that I generated using step to feed in the intermediate certificate, but this is the public certificate from the uh, spiffy issuer within Teleport, and I basically had to like paste that in and provide it. And so that uh, initially we weren't quite sure like if that was gonna, it, we're pretty sure it was gonna work, but it was sort of an open question. And getting this certificate out of Teleport is not hard, but it, you have to run a command, I gotta copy paste it, like this is not a very automatable solution. Um, and so that's certainly another thing that we wanna try to improve. Um, and at one point, we kind of thought it was going to have to be that you had to have the private key out of Teleport and use it to create an issuer, and we don't do that at all, because our whole point is that you shouldn't be able to access any of that stuff because everything should go through Teleport, right? And so there was a an, an direct conflict there between Linkerd assuming you have full control over your certificate of, uh, authority system, and us assuming that Teleport has full control over your certificate authority system. And, um, and so that caused some friction early on as well. Yes? Sorry, can you, can you come a little closer or come to the mic or something? I just, I can't quite hear you. Okay, yeah, the, the, the source of truth for workload attestation? Yes, so what should be the, the two question? Yeah. Uh, first one is, what, in Kubernetes environment, what should be the source of truth for a workload attestation? Um, is that a just doc label or pod annotation or what else can be the uh, source of truth for a workload attestation? That's uh, a great question. So um, I haven't delved super deep into the Kubernetes attestation. I'd almost say, hey, you want to come up and, <laughs> and <laughs> talk about it from Spire? Um, I, like, I mean, it's metadata about the pod and the, or the service count that's, that's collected in Kubernetes, right, for that, for that plugin. Um, yeah, so uh, I, this is a place where I'm gonna admit my own limitations and say, like, I would, I would go read the Spire uh, 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 documentation on that, because it's, it's advanced um, and, and really capable. Uh, but yeah, I think within Kubernetes what you're looking at, but I think talking about the source of truth, like, in any of these systems, whether it's our system or Spire, you have to register the set of metadata that you want to use for workload attestation, so you are saying, you know, take this metadata and, and it's assert that that's this pod, yeah. right? Um, or that's this workload. And, and for whether that's um, Linux and you're talking about group and user IDs or process IDs or whether it's uh, a TPM that you're using or whether it's in Kubernetes, that, that pod metadata, um, you're having to provide that into the central system somehow. Yeah, yeah. so that's a, a very quick follow-up question from the first, uh, uh, question asked regarding sure. the Spire. Um, I never got convinced by Spire's like doing a testation in the last mile, which is like in the host level. Okay. So because for Kubernetes, it's always the decision, first decision come from the API server, 
Now, like the question is, is that really necessary? What should be the place we do the workload attestation? At a host or API server? I, uh, because API servers already have the, all the social tools. Sure. Um, that's a great question. <laughs> I, think, I think that's a question I'll bring back to, to the engineers working on this, and I think that's something we'll discuss. Yeah, um, I, yeah I'm, I'm going to be completely honest with you that I don't know that I feel qualified to answer that question and, and tell you that, so, that that's better than, than the host. I think, um, I mean, yeah, please do. I, it's an open discussion. That's, yeah, that's good. Answer. I'm being asked to step down, so I'm going to come down with you all. Yeah.